Welcome to part three of Berdenburg's podcast on key insights from the political agreement on the AI Act. I am Feo Sikkinger, your host, and I'm joined by my colleagues Simon Hemd and Oliver Bellitz, both AI legal and regulatory specialists. Many thanks for being with us here. In the previous episode, we touched upon the fundamentals of the Act, the high-risk approach and regulation of general-purpose AI models and systems. And if this is the first episode you're listening to, I suggest you start with part one and two to get the full picture. And in this episode, we will discuss bias in AI systems, how to deal with it, enforcement of the new rules, penalties, what individuals can do, and some key takeaways that might be useful to you, including the timing of the rest of the regulatory process and what to expect. So starting off, Simon, with bias, how does the regulation deal with it? Many thanks, Leo. Yes, um, it's one of the, actually, it's one of the most um, or major ethical um, aims that the AI Act is kind of uh, following and trying to um, to achieve. And um, it's uh, the main idea behind it is kind of to design the models and to safeguard them in a way that they are not generating any discriminatory or biased content. And we found on several um, um, uh, provisions of the AI Act that they try to kind of ensure these goals. Um, first thing is that the kind of basic principle is that the, um, the AI system have to be technically robust. This means, uh, in practice, this means kind of, okay, um, you have to make sure that it's fitting its purpose, that it's, um, yeah, giving right answers, yeah, that they're not affecting um, some protected groups. So, um, in practice, what does it mean? If I'm using an AI tool in an assessment center, for instance, yeah, and just trying to evaluate the candidates, and I'm not using a very robust system, which is saying, well, this person is not suitable for his job due to his, for instance, age or something, and I'm kind of um, relying on this, and um, so I'm making potentially a decision which is uh, disproportionately affecting a protected group, like the... Uh, like older people for instance so so this is um this is something which is kind of a basic principle of the ai act um and then we got going from there we got s- several further provisions like um uh we have to use uh sufficiently representative uh, data sets what does that mean um i think one of the biggest fears is that there are some ai tools which are using specific data sets but which are biased yeah like um um containing some some text or something which are affecting protected groups like yeah some racial biases for instance and by this by by um, yeah um, using this provision it's it's try to ensure that only yeah sufficiently representative data sets which contain different opinions different views um, are used for training the ai and yeah, and then of course the 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 monitoring of the AI before and after placing on market is very important, just to see how the AI tool works. Yeah, when users, uh, masses of users are using the AI, how does the AI react, and do we have to install in, in, or establish some safeguards? As a user or, or deployer, as the uh, data act says, if, if I want to use such a model, how do I know it's it's free from bias? Do I need to test it? Or has that already been done? Actually, it's. Uh, I think we cannot be one hundred percent clear on that. I think it's it's something which is investigated ex post after after its use. Of course, we get some testing periods up front. Yeah, sure, where the AI is tested. But yeah, when uh, when millions of people are using it, then we really see which kind which kind of output it generates. So that kind of after placing on the market monitoring and surveillance is required just to to evaluate whether uh, it's biased or not. When I was in the US, I, I spoke to some companies who are working on taking out bias in AI systems uh, and put them into a testing environment, a sort of what we would call a, a sandbox, uh, and then put a stamp on it. This has been tested for bias and the system is okay. So there will be a large market for data scientists and, and data analytic uh, specialists. 
to uh, to to look into those uh, and uh, and it all contributes to the whole principle that uh, we want trustworthy AI uh, which is free from from bias and uh, certainly a point to look into uh, to if you uh, want to rely on the outcome of automated decision making especially when it affects uh, people at, at the workplace yeah. thanks for that um, let's talk about uh, the enforcement of the AI Act. Uh, we have an AI board, we have an AI office, there will be national competent authorities. How is all this supposed to work together? Yeah, um, we, we see in, in other acts or uh, uh, like, the, the, like the DSA um, that the, the national competent authorities are just... Um, Yeah, have to be designated by member states and these national authorities um, are obliged to supervise the application implementation of the AI Act in the member states and they're also doing the market surveillance as well. So the basic work um, is made on the member state level and then uh, we also have to kind of bring everyone together and to align these authorities and for that uh, every member state has to designate a national supervisory authority which is representing the individual member state in the European Artificial Intelligence Board. This is kind of a point of contact where all the authorities come together and can align their actions and can talk with each other and uh, talk about latest developments. So this is kind of a board which brings all the national uh, views and all the national authorities together. Um, and also we got an advisory forum, which is kind of um, bringing in the technical expertise. And this is Uh, staffed by uh, um, experts from, from the industry or from the academia. And then we also got the European AI office, as you mentioned, and as Oliver mentioned earlier today, um, which um, within the commission, which is supervising the general uh, purpose AI models. So and when we come to enforcement, we also need to talk about penalties. Uh, and there are some penalty provisions in the AI, but does that mean that Those, those penalties will be the same in the, in, across the uh, entire European Union? The, the member states uh, will have to lay down the, the uh, penalties in the first place. So um, they are, can impose the fines which are tired in the AI Act. We got different tires like for, for infringement of uh, uh, provisions on uh, prohibited systems, which can be up to 35 million or 7% of the total worldwide annual turnover. Then we got 50 million or 3% of the total worldwide annual turnover for any other infringements, like for infringements of provisions of high risk or uh, general purpose AI um, models. And then we got 7.5 uh, million or 1% of the total worldwide annual turnover for, yeah, when I'm providing misleading information to the bodies. But here, um, so... We can say the, the individual member states can impose these fines and can, uh, have to find proportionate and effective for, uh, fi uh, penalties. But um, the commission will draw up guidelines here just to kind of harmonize it, just uh, to make sure that the, the differences between the member states are not too big. And then lastly, on, on, on this point, if I'm an individual and I think I'm, I'm negatively affected by the outcome of automated decision making, Uh, what rights do I have in this respect? Yes, um, this is an important question, actually. And um, I think the very beginning of any potential claims or um, um, which an individual person can assert is information. So um, if, if a person uh, feels that there is some kind of infringement or something, it can, in first place, lodge a complaint with the national authority. So this is the way the AI Act provides um, it says, okay, the authority is informed and is now knowing that there is something going on and can then decide whether they launch activities or not. So this is one, one way uh, which a user can take. But from a civil law perspective, um, they can then use the, um, uh, for instance, the uh, AI liability directive, um, which is providing some uh, cl claims to information which can be used just to, to yeah, get the, the required knowledge to evaluate whether there are claims or not. So um, 
yeah, just to open the black box or something, we can, if they feel that the high risk system is infringing their rights, then they can claim for information and can check uh, whether it's right or not. So there are some disclosure of evidence in this AI liability directive. Um, and also we got the uh, re revision of the product liability directive when some products are using AI, uh, like, uh, like cars or household goods are using AI, and I'm yeah, suffering some personal injuries, I can also um, use the uh, additional claims here in the product liability directive just to uh, yeah, kind of uh, enforce my rights. Thank you, Simon. And before we close part three of this podcast series, if you are in Brussels, you may want to join in our in-person event on the AI Act on the 19th of March with speakers from the European Commission and the industry. And during this event, we will dive into the challenges and practicalities of the implementation by businesses. And if you're interested in attending, please send an email to the address mentioned in the show notes. A bit later on, we will come back to you with part four of a podcast series on AI liability and the opportunities that are provided to the market through regulatory sandboxes sandboxes to test new applications before releasing them to the market. Meanwhile, we hope you have enjoyed this episode. Stay safe and keep exploring AI.